You're listening to Tales. Today I'm concluding the story of Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves, the enthralling tale of villainous thieves and murderous revenge plots. The tales on this podcast are dark, sometimes scary, and full of adult themes. As a warning, this story involves dark subjects, including stabbing and torture with hot oil. Please exercise caution for children under 13. As mentioned in our previous episodes, Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves is not a tale filled with wizards and fairy dust, and the incredible elements could actually be based in reality, but that doesn't mean that the tale isn't ripe with symbolism and parable. Some literary scholars believe the tale's cave is a spiritual allegory for the human heart. The heart can inspire jealousy. An impure heart will cause acts of mayhem or murder. But someone who is pure of heart can find untold beauty and magic hidden within themselves. Ultimately, this story assures us that knowing the richness of our own heart is the fairy tale happily ever after we came for. If you want to hear more tales, you can find episodes on your favorite podcast directory. While you're there, we'd really appreciate a five-star review. A new episode will release every other Saturday. So if you enjoy it, subscribe. But for now, we return to Morgiana as she learns that the large jars on her master's property are not filled with oil, but dangerous men. Captain! Captain! Morgiana was surrounded by whispers. She had a feeling this had to do with Kasim's murder and the chalk marks she had found on the front of the house. But there was no time to think about these details. She had to make sure these men never left these jars. Gathering her wits, Morgiana lowered her voice as deeply as she could and replied gruffly, Not yet. The time has not yet come. She whispered to the jar as closely as she could without revealing that she was a woman. She went to the next jar and repeated the same thing. The time has not yet come. She did this as quickly as she could so that no man would pop his head out and learn her identity. Morgiana was shaking by the time she reached the last jar. To her relief, it was filled with the oil she was looking for. She would be able to light her lamp after all. Morgiana rushed back to the kitchen as quickly as she could with the jar of mustard oil in tow. The jar was torturously heavy, but there was no time to rouse anyone else. One false move one raised voice, and the murderous man sleeping in the house could awake. There was no chance risking a war between the household and 38 violent bandits. No, she had to act alone. Morgiana lit her lamp and got to work. She poured the oil into a giant cauldron and brought it to a hearty boil. Once it was mercilessly hot, Morgiana portioned out the oil by the potful. She returned to the shed, where one by one she began pouring the searing oil onto each man hidden in the jar. She acted swiftly and without a second thought. She didn't want one of the thieves screaming and alarming the others, but she quickly found that the oil covered them so quickly and so thoroughly that they were suffocated and burned alive instantly. At last, each jar contained a scalded corpse, no longer a man with a foul intent, but a body to be buried. Morgiana returned to the kitchen as if nothing had happened. No one had been alerted, All was well in the night. Morgiana smiled. Now she could finish making the broth for the morning. Masood woke with a start. 
the sun was breaking on the horizon. He had slept almost the entire night. He cursed himself and flung open the window to his room. That was odd. His men weren't responding to his signal. Normally, they were quick to attention. Still nothing. Perchance they had fallen asleep. Masood cried out to them, trying his best to keep his voice from waking Ali Baba and his wives. But the shed was a tomb. He quickly and quietly made his way out to the shed, his path lit by the dawn. Something was not right. The shed reeked of burning flesh and hot oil. He ran to a jar to see if someone could explain what was going on. And as he peered into the leather jar, he saw the cracked, oozing flesh of one of his men. He ran to the next jar, and the next. He wailed as he saw that every one of his men had met this fate. Blistering skin covered the dead bodies, mouths frozen in horror as they gasped for one last breath. Masood fled as quickly as his legs could carry him. He had no idea Ali Baba could be capable of such cruel, heinous torture. He ran quickly into the courtyard, scaled the pristine white wall, and absconded into the waning night before the man came after him, too. <laughs> Ali Baba had gone to the baths before the sun rose and didn't return until the late morning. As he walked home, he reflected upon how much he had enjoyed conversing with the oil merchant the evening before. He was sorry that he would not cross paths with him again this morning. And yet, when Ali Baba returned, he could hear the mules braying in the shed. He called to Morgiana, who promptly met him in the yard. Why has our oil merchant not gone to market? Morgiana shook her head grimly. Master Ali, I regret to inform you that our oil merchant was not an oil merchant after all. Ali didn't understand, but followed Morgiana into the shed, where she insisted he look into the jar. Ali approached cautiously, unnerved by her somber tone. Ali saw the crumbling, burnt flesh and the oozing blood coming out of the cracked skin. He covered his nose at the intense burning smell. What cursed event took place here? He cried. Do not be afraid, master, Morgiana told him calmly and firmly. Look inside every jar. The man that visited us last night was no oil merchant, but a thieving assassin who brought a band of men to murder us all in the dead of night. She then explained to him how she had run out of oil working late, and what she discovered as she came out to borrow the amount of oil needed to complete her tasks. Ali was so shocked at what the brave girl had done for him and his family, he wanted to weep. He profusely thanked Morgiana for all that she had done for them. He told her he would never forget this act of selflessness, even until his last breath. Thank you, master. Morgiana accepted this praise humbly, as she always did. And what became of the captain? Ali inquired. Morgiana sighed. He crawled over the wall and ran off like a scalded dog. As relieved as Ali was that he had narrowly escaped death, he could not help but take note of this large number of men. Surely this was the same group of bandits he had seen at the Cave of Treasures. And if the captain had gotten away, would he be back? The thought of his brother's hacked body lingered in his mind and now the blood of his men was on his hands. Ali Baba had to shake that out of his mind. Surely this was protection from Allah, and they were saved. Morgiana, send for Abdullah. 
We must bury these bodies at once. Our story will continue in a moment after the break. Listeners, this month marks 60 years since John F. Kennedy became the 35th President of the United States, ushering his already prominent family into the highest enclaves of political power. But behind their storied successes lie secrets and scandals so severe, if it were any other lineage, they would have been left in ruin. This January, to commemorate this iconic milestone, dig into the dramas of a real-life American dynasty in the Spotify original from Parcast, The Kennedys. This exclusive series from Spotify features your favorite ParCast hosts, including me, covering every angle of the Kennedys from shows like Conspiracy Theories, Unsolved Murders, Crime Countdown, and others. Assassinations and conspiracies, corruption and cover-ups, international affairs, and extramarital ones, too. Examine all of the Kennedy family's most controversial moments, all in one place. You can binge all 12 episodes of this this limited series starting on Tuesday, January 19th. Follow the Kennedys free and exclusively on Spotify. Now, our story continues. Masood was consumed with a singular rage at Ali Baba for murdering his entire company of men. He sat alone in the cave for days, stewing, fuming, cursing his enemy. He had underestimated his opponent. He didn't know how that man, Ali Baba, had ever found the cave, or how he knew to foil his plan and murder 37 men as he slept. But clearly this man was a strategic genius. Confound this Ali Baba! Masood would have to be shrewd with his next plan. He knew this for certain. He didn't want his silver and gold and all his fine things waiting around for Ali Baba to come again. Who knew what other powerful men he could bring here? No, now that he was on his own, he would have to sell it before the man could steal it. Masood knew he would have the last laugh. He always did. He might have to lay low for a while, try a different tactic than the one he was used to, but one didn't amass the fortune that he had by being daft and easily fooled. Masood would just have to bide his time. He cut his ponytail and removed his jewelry. He made sure he would be completely unrecognizable when he became a purveyor of exquisite goods. Masood transformed into a high-end merchant from far away. He brought the foreign silks and exotic tea sets that he knew no one in this city would have, and set up a stall. His name was now Khwaja Hassan, to whomever asked. He was even genteel. Masood never knew he could be such an accomplished performer. Masood discovered he enjoyed selling his treasures in the marketplace. Now that he was without his men, he found himself enjoying the company of the other merchants. His booth was located by several other shopkeepers of exquisite merchandise, and over time he developed a good rapport with a young man named Abazar. He was handsome, smart, amiable, they would often find themselves in conversation long after the market had closed. One particularly slow morning, Masood went over to Abazar's shop to see how his young friend was faring. To his astonishment, he saw Ali Baba sitting in there, perfectly at home. Even though Masood knew he looked very different in his merchant garb, he kept walking. He avoided glancing in the direction of the shop until hours later. Masood had not forgotten his plans of revenge on Ali Baba, but he had not had the right opportunity to fashion his next move until now, and he didn't want to mess it up. The second time that he saw Ali Baba seated in Abazar's shop, 
Masood said something to the young merchant. Who is that man that comes round and visits you? Are you taking on a partner in your business? Abazar laughed and shook his head. No, no, that is my uncle, my late father's brother. His name is Ali Baba, and he has been a great help to my family after my father passed away quite suddenly earlier this year. Masood had to bite his tongue to keep his jaw from dropping. Ali Baba was this man's uncle. This was a blessing from Allah beyond what Masood could ever have hoped for. Not that he quite knew what to do with this information yet, but this was certainly a sign. Masood began showing Abazar extra favor, bringing him small presents from his vast cave of treasures, and sharing fine, succulent meats and other culinary delicacies with him. Masood was going to do whatever he could do to curry favor. His plan worked quicker than Masood expected. Masood and Abazar took an afternoon stroll one day, and Abazar stopped in front of a very familiar house, Ali Baba's. Dear Hwaja Hassan, this is my second home, the house I grew up in. My uncle, the man you asked about, lives here now. He's heard so much about you, and it would be an honor to introduce you and receive you in his home. Abazar's young eyes looked so eager to bring together two men he admired deeply that Masood almost felt bad about his ultimate purpose. No, no, let's do it another time. Surely he will not like a surprise guest. But Abazar grabbed his arm and insisted. My uncle adores having guests for dinner. Please, it was a long day in the marketplace. Certainly you must be famished. It was too late. Ali Baba had heard the voices and came out to greet his visitors. He embraced his nephew and heartily shook Masood's hand. For a moment, Masood was terrified that Ali Baba might recognize him. But Ali Baba was delightfully oblivious. He was overjoyed to meet the merchant who had taken his nephew under his wing. Still, Masood was on edge. He was not prepared for this moment to come so soon. Thank you for guiding my nephew in the affairs of business. I have heard such wonderful things about you and your vast knowledge of foreign goods. Masood graciously accepted the compliment and allowed himself to relax a little. His hidden identity was safe and secure. Before he could resist, Ali Baba was already leading them through the yard and into his immense house. He led them into a parlor where he already had wine for himself poured. He made haste to pour two more glasses for his companions. I hope you enjoy lamb, Hwaja Hassan. We have the most tender chops you have ever tasted. Masood still felt he should try and arrange his siege for a time when Abazar was not present, come back to visit Ali Baba as a new friend when he could be alone. He rubbed his stomach and gave his best apologetic look. I'm afraid that is probably not the wisest idea. By order of my physician, I must not eat salt. I don't want to be difficult. I shall come back another time. No, that is not a problem. Ali laughed at such a small matter. I will tell my slave girl Morgiana. She won't have begun cooking yet. She is an outstanding cook, makes everything fresh. You won't even notice the salt is missing. He watched as Ali disappeared back towards the kitchen. Masood knew that he was stuck here now. Perhaps this was a sign from Allah that it was time to act. He had his dagger in his robe after all. As he sipped his wine, trying to listen to Abazar over his racing thoughts, he knew what he would do. He would wait until after the meal, when Abdullah the slave boy and Morgiana had finished serving the meal and disappeared back into their quarters. 
Then he would quickly slit Ali Baba's throat and tell Abazar to run unless he wanted to meet the same fate. It wasn't how he had imagined taking his revenge, but he doubted he'd get a better opportunity. Yes, yes, that is what he would do. Morgiana expertly chopped the lamb as she prepared Ali Baba's evening meal. Ali Baba entered the kitchen, as he did on occasion, to chat with her and see how things were coming along. Hello, Master Ali, Morgiana greeted him warmly. Morgiana, we will be entertaining a guest for dinner this evening. Very good. We have plenty of food, and I think he shall be most pleased with the meal. She massaged the pieces she had so cleanly cut, making them as tender as possible. Our guest has requested that you refrain from adding salt to the meal. Ali Baba shrugged. A medical issue. Not a problem, Morgiana responded quickly, but she wondered what sort of visitor they had. Who would make such a request? After Ali returned to his guests, she quietly peered into the room and saw Abazar animatedly speaking to a well-dressed man, tall and imposing. He looked very familiar. Morgiana scrunched her brow as she tried to place the dark, haunting eyes. Where had she seen them before? We'll return to our story in just a moment. And now, back to Tales. Morgiana's stomach dropped. Abazar's friend from the market was the treacherous oil merchant assassin. Yes, it was definitely the man who had come here before, posing as a mustard oil salesman. He had come to exact his revenge. Morgiana recoiled behind the door. She didn't want the captain of the thieves she had murdered to see her looking at him with recognition. The man looked completely different, but she knew those eyes. She never forgot a face, certainly not the face of a man that had crossed this threshold with the intent to murder. She peered through the crack of the barely opened door and watched him throw his head back and laugh. As he did, his robe fell open slightly, and she saw the glint of a dagger. She knew that he must want to get her master alone, which she would not allow to happen. She would have to strike first. She called for the men to take their seats at the dinner table, and serenely served them their supper not letting on that she recognized the man or thought anything was off about his sudden arrival. She noticed the villainous man observing her with a combination of suspicion and attraction. She smiled pleasantly, as if she were enjoying his presence. She made herself scarce as soon as she was done serving the dinner. As the men joked and laughed warmly and enjoyed her delicious cooking, Morjana grabbed the slave boy Abdullah in the kitchen. Abdullah, after you have cleared the plates for the evening, would you be so kind as to play your tambourine for our guest this evening? I would love to show our visitors some entertainment as they enjoy their post-dinner tea. Abdullah nodded, and Morjana left and put on the few fine garments she owned, those she wore for belly dancing. She loved dancing and was always happy to oblige Ali Baba when he wanted entertainment for his guests after dinner. But this time, she would also slip a small dagger into her waistband, concealed by her shimmering belt. Morgiana stepped out into the expansive dining room, surprising even Ali Baba. She struck a dramatic, alluring pose as she entered the room. All eyes were on her. Morjana, what a wonderful idea! Ali Baba clapped gaily and poured more wine for Abazar and his guest, who both downed the glasses readily at the sight of the enchanting dancer. 
My lord, you provide such pleasing entertainment, Masood said. Entranced by the hypnotic movements of Morgiana's hips, Morgiana began twirling around the table, smiling, laughing, as if lost in her own pleasure. Everyone was watching her. She loved that Abazar couldn't take his eyes off of her. She wanted to keep dancing and dancing and not have to do what she had to do. But she had to protect her master even if she was about to ruin this perfect moment. Morgiana stopped in front of Masood. She gave him a coy, come-hither glance. Now was her opportunity to strike. She had to take it. She had never stabbed anyone, and certainly not at a dinner party. Could she do it? She thought she might just continue twirling, but she saw the man's lips curl up at her in an alluring smile. Before he had a chance to see what was happening, Morgiana whipped out her dagger and plunged it into Masood's heart. Masood stood up and collapsed instantly on the floor. He knew he was dying. His eyes grew blurry as the slave woman stood over him triumphantly. She smiled down at him knowingly as he choked and took his last breaths. And in that moment, Masood realized she had known his identity all along. She had known that he was the man who had pretended to be the oil merchant, and he could finally see her for who she was. She was the one who had drawn the X's on the houses, and she had been the one to pour oil on his men, burning them to death. Of course it was her. She noticed everything. She was so shrewd, so competent, and yet she had barely said a word. He heaved one final breath. As he closed his eyes for good, his last thought was that he was right. Morgiana would have made a great wife. She was a bandit at heart. Morgiana, what have you done? Ali Baba screamed, his hands on his head in disbelief and horror. You have ruined me. No, I have saved you. Morgiana pointed to the dead man's face. This is the same man who brought 37 bandits to your home and disguised himself as a mustard oil merchant in the hopes of slaying you. Ali Baba looked down at the dead man and clutched his heart, overwhelmed. Morgiana had saved him from death's clutches yet again. She kicked open the bandit's robe, revealing his dagger. Ali Baba and Abazar's eyes widened when they saw the weapon. Morgiana, his voice was husky with emotion. You have been our savior beyond all imagination. You are a model of loyalty. From this moment onward, you are no slave in this household. You are a free woman. And beyond that, you are a member of this family. He looked to her with admiration and sincerity. He grabbed her hand and Abazar's. Please take my nephew's hand in marriage. Abazar looked up at Morgiana expectantly. He smiled kindly, and she knew he'd care for her and respect her the same as he would if she were the daughter of an esteemed sheikh. Yes, yes, of course, Morgiana said. She broke down in tears of gratitude. She had never dreamed of becoming a wife, a lady of a respectable household. And now here she was, holding a bloody dagger in her hand and getting her happily ever after. She laughed as Abazar stood up to embrace her, his new wife. They took the body of Masood and buried him deep into the ground where the other thieves were buried. No one spoke of the foul incident ever again, moving finally into a chapter of abundance, calm and good fortune. 
Ali Baba's wives Karima and Zara both supported the union of Abazar and Morjana. Zara had always loved Morjana and felt a debt of gratitude for how she handled the aftermath of Kasim's murder. And Karima was astounded by Morjana's bravery and loyal defense of her beloved husband. There was no question, she was a part of the family. Abazar and Morgiana married with much festivity and dancing. Over the next few years, Morgiana bore Abazar several children, and those children came to love their uncle Ali Baba as much as they did. One day, after much time had passed, Ali decided that he would go back to the forest and find the magical cave of treasures. He was certain that all of the thieves had perished, and he was no longer haunted by fear that someone was coming to find him. He tied up his horse when he arrived at that spot in the forest. He strode nervously over to the rock. Last time he'd seen it, Ali Baba had been a simple woodcutter. It felt like another life. As he stood in front of the boulder, he called out, Open, O Simsim, once again. And to his wonderment, the cave was exactly as he had last seen it. No one had touched it, and as he stepped foot inside, he knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that he was the sole surviving person who knew what treasures lay beyond this stone. From that moment on, the contents of the cave became the personal belongings of Ali Baba's family. He wanted his sons and his sons' sons to have the security that he had never had. He never wanted anyone, firstborn, secondborn, or thirdborn, to know the poverty and hardship of life in the slums. For generations, no one would have to live the difficult life that he had once known as a pauper and a woodcutter. Ali Baba and his descendants lived out their lives with dignity, respect, and joy. Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves is regarded as a quintessentially Arabian tale. And yet so many of the themes in this story still resonate today with a Western audience. The idea that a man could start from humble beginnings and rise to become a person of great influence and power. Or the idea that generosity and honesty will always triumph over greed and materialism, good over evil. In many ways, the themes in this story were ahead of their time. Because perhaps what makes this story feel most relevant and timely for today's audience is that this is a deeply feminist tale. Our villain is outwitted by a woman. Our hero has to be saved by a woman, twice. At the end of the day, this is Morgiana's story. And even if she doesn't get the credit in the title, anyone who knows Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves knows that this is ultimately a tale of girl power. Thanks for listening to Tales. If you want to listen to more tales, you can find us and subscribe on your favorite podcast directory or listen on parcast.com. If you enjoyed the show, we'd truly appreciate a five-star review. Tales was created by Max Cutler. It is a production of Cutler Media and is part of the Parcast Network. It is produced by Max and Ron Cutler, sound designed by Ron Shapiro, with production assistance by Paul Mahler. Additional production assistance by Maggie Admire and Carly Madden. Tales is written by Gina Machusik. I'm Vanessa Richardson.